Welcome back to FuryCast. But first, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and of course, smash the bell for notifications. And don't forget to sign up to the mailing list for my new graphic novel, illustrated by the world famous e by Canales. Sign up now. The link is in the description. He's a motorcycle enthusiast, a cigar aficionado. He also has a successful YouTube channel. Today on FuryCast, I welcome my friend, Ty Blackwell. What's going on, Ty? Same old thing, different day, man. What's happening? <laughs> everything's good on this end, man. Everything's good. Uh, for everybody out there that might not be familiar with Ty, he runs a successful YouTube channel. Uh, give a shout out to the YouTube channel, Ty. Man, the YouTube channel is called Gats and Grips, G-A-T-S-N-G-O-I-P-S. You should be able to see it right there on the description right there, uh, right above my face, man, um, on YouTube. Check it out, guys, if you haven't already. Absolutely, absolutely. So Ty's an interesting interesting cat. I know him personally. I wanted to have him on the show, and I want to go over a little bit of your your journey in life, man. I know we're, we just talked a little bit before we started recording, and um, we're, we're uh, very close in age, and yeah. uh, so... I want to hear your story from uh, someone from my generation. Take me back. We uh, we met here in Houston. Are you originally from Houston? Yes. There you go, everybody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, what side of town did you grow up, and what was that like? What was what was growing up in H Town like, man? Man, you know what I, you know, a lot of like most people you know they have a, a a hood or something a neighborhood or something that they can say they came from and stuff like that you know and um i can't really say that you know growing up we did a lot of moving and stuff so as soon as you get comfortable somewhere it'd be time to go it wasn't because my parents were in the military or nothing like that i i think my my old man he just likes he just liked variety he, he was always switching up, you know, from houses to cars and all that kind of stuff. So it, it I don't, I, I'm, I'm from Houston, man. I'm not from the North. I'm really not from the South. I'm, I'm, I'm just from Houston. I can relate, man. Same here. You know, I mean, uh, we moved around from state to state even. And when I tell people that they're like, Oh, you were a, a, a army brat. No, <laughs> right. my right. parents just moved me all the time, you know? Exactly. So it was like, I, I counted, I think I went to five different high schools. You yeah, know. I did too, man. I, 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 I mean, I can count the high schools. I mean, I, I went to, in high school alone, I went to maybe five different districts. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't all, because, some of it was because we moved. Some of it was just, you know, disciplinary actions. Stuff like that. Well, same here. We'll I was I was uh I was asked to uh to remove myself from one school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was asked to, to remove myself from several. So it it's you know it's what it is. Yeah. So yeah, see, we're yeah, we got a lot in common already. So yeah, I have the same <laughs> issue where where are you from? It's like uh, what part of Houston? I mean, I've lived east side, south side, west side, you know. So it's exactly. like, you know. I'm I'm from out there is where I'm from. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm just I'm just from Houston. That's it, man. So what do you think? I'm I'm interested because what because for me, uh, there were, there's challenges in that, but there's also benefit. Everything you know, everything that might hurt you in the beginning, you know, God can use for for benefit for you later. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think that affected you as a kid? Uh. I don't know, honestly. It is. It's hard to. It's hard to uh, put it all together. I, I, I feel you. It's, I, I, I can't say it was a a, a good or bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a kid, I you know you don't like it as a kid. You but... Don't like it as a kid. You know, yeah. you want to stay because you get you get friends and all that kind of stuff. And having to leave them as a kid is hard. But uh, it it's not like something that affected me and carried on as an adult. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm I'm. I've always been somebody that I can get along with anybody. At the yeah. same time, I've always liked kind of being by myself as well, you know. So 
having to transition from one place to another, for me, it wasn't as hard as I, I would imagine maybe other kids and stuff like that. I mean, it was it would just be a brief moment of maybe disappointment slash anger or something like that. But as soon as you move, yeah. you realize, oh, this is cool, too. You know what I yeah. mean? And then when you once you do that so many times, once you hear the news that it's time to move, you already kind of anticipating that, OK, it's going to be something new and exciting because you've done so much. And you and the disappointment turns into actually something positive. So it, it, it wasn't it, it's not it, I don't I don't consider it a negative. Yeah. Yeah. The more I can contextualize it as an adult. Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's there's pros and cons. You know, there's things I wouldn't want to go through, but there's definitely, you know, like you said, I if you had my wife describe me, she would say probably what you said. I could get along with everybody, but you know, right. more than I'd probably rather just be, <laughs> you know, but you put me with people, you know, right. Hey, you know, I can, I can get along with people and really I can find common ground with almost anybody, almost right. anybody. There's some people out there that just don't want common ground, but um, yeah, there's, there's always that one person, you know what I mean? But um, even that one person, you know, I mean, like, like I've always been taught, uh, keep your friends closer and your enemies closer. So even those people that choose to not get along or anything like or something like that, you know, I can still manage or find a way to get along with that person, you know, yeah. instead of it just being beef all the time and stuff like that, you know. So me being able to get along with people and stuff like that or blend in, and that's never been an issue. Yeah. So what were you like uh, after high school? What was your journey there? After high school? Yes, sir. Um, I described it in one word. Lost. I had no idea. That sounds like the 90s to me. <laughs> I never knew, really knew what I wanted to, to do or be uh, growing up. You know, a lot of a lot of kids, they, they have that. I want to be a fireman when I grow up. I want to be a cop when I grow up, stuff like that. And I never really had that. I never saw anything. And I still never see anything to this day at 49 years old where I, I just look and say, that's something I want to do for the rest of my life. Nothing else. You know, it, it's that's always just been awkward to me, you know, to just pick one thing at such an early age or at any age and then just limit yourself to just that. Um, I could just could never see myself doing that. I don't know if that was a, a if that ended up being a negative or a positive in my life, because uh, pretty sure i maybe could have done something bigger lawyer or some junk like that but being the way i am i could go through all of that stuff and be a lawyer and then once i'm a lawyer i'm like all right this is boring what else is there you yeah. know so there's plenty of people with that journey i know a lot of a lot of people with law degrees that are not <laughs> that's not lawyers. lawyer yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah Exactly. So I know I a know. bunch. I've always, tried to keep, I've always tried to keep my plate open as far as being able to do things and um, experience new things and stuff like that. I've never wanted to just be stuck doing one thing. So, did you try any careers or did you, what did you do in the night? For, for me, the 90s, you know, my out of high school years was the same, kind of like going from one thing to the next, trying to find, trying to find my thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of jealous of my peers that kind of had a trajectory. Um, I came from, you know, I didn't have a dad in the home. My parents were split up at a very early age. I didn't really have uncles to take me under their wing and, and show me what it was like to to be a man or talk to girls and that stuff. So um, I kind of had to figure out everything on my own. And it kind and and really, I feel like it took me twice as long. Now, the benefit of that is it also build this, you know, in, in martial arts, particularly when I studied Taekwondo back in the day, there's a concept called indomitable spirit, you know, this unbreakable spirit. And I would say the challenges that that created um, did give me an indomitable spirit. But, you know, some of my family members, I saw it break them. You right. know, right. so, you know, everybody's journey is different in how everybody contextualizes it and, and processes um, their journey is different, which is one of the reasons I like talking to people like yourself, just to get their story and, um, and, and, and see how that went down. Um, but did you ever try uh military or anything like that? 
Uh, I never tried military. I mean, the closest I ever tried to military was ROTC in high school. Same here, man. Maybe we were on the field together at the same time competing, baby. <laughs> hey, I, you know, one thing I learned from ROTC is I had an issue taking orders. You know, but I was at the time I was young and stuff. So it, I, you know, same if I would know did what I know now, it most likely would have been a different story. Same but, here. Yeah. Like then, man, I, yeah, you know, and then having to take orders from somebody that's pretty much your age, it made it even worse. You know, so yeah. They were officer because they got better grades. Exactly. Or maybe they was in a in a in a grade higher than you or something like that, you know, yeah. and it, it, it just went to the head, you know, in, in my experience anyway. Uh, so that lasted maybe two years if I remember right. Yeah, you know, same like, here. I, I did two years of ROTC and in hindsight, once again, hindsight, I really regret not going into the service. Mm -hmm. But I remember my thought process processes at the time was I don't like getting screamed at. Right. You know, right. which is, you know, I guess the way a 18 year old would process that. But without without, you know, in hindsight now, it's like, man, if I if I think I could have short shortened that time I was talking about earlier, that time spent figuring things out on my own. I think I probably could have cut that in half through military yeah. service. And I listened yeah, to my yeah. friends who went talk, talk about the military. It's completely different than what I thought. They were like, oh, yeah. yeah, I just do my job. We're, we're we're in Germany. Then eight hours of my job, then I go into Germany <laughs> and I party. And I'm right. like, and as a 20-year-old, that would have been fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I was so, I mean, the misconception I had growing up about the military, I mean, I have and still have family, you know, that is in the military, but mm -hmm. I didn't have anyone that was, I didn't have direct family, like a mom, dad, brother, or nothing like that. Mm -hmm, yeah. <clears throat> and so I, I, grew up with this misconception of the military, you know, by watching, you know, by what I saw on TV. I thought the barracks was like Gomer Pyle. I'm thinking, I'm thinking military equals war. If you go yeah. to the military front line, that's it. I didn't, yeah. and, and it's crazy because I didn't even realize until I was probably in my mid twenties and met other people in the military and they would tell me about their experiences. And it, and that's when it dawned on me that you don't have to, be on a front line in the military, you know, I mean, to hear guys say, oh, man, I was a mechanic, you know, or, or I did this or, or I did that or doctor or whatever, you know, it, it, it blew me away. Yeah. Because of the misconception I had of the military. It was like, when you go into the military, you go, you fight, maybe you come back. And my biggest thing was I just did not want to risk my life for someone else's war. Yeah. And um, so my, cause my old man, he would always try to encourage me to go to the military. And I was yeah. like, I'm not fighting for nobody. We had parents from that, that generation was trying to get you out of the house. They're always trying <laughs> to get you in the military, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> exactly. You know, what you going to do with yourself? Go to the military. Yeah. You know, you better, you like join that. the army. <laughs> yeah, join the army. You know, they just get out, you know, okay. take, you know, do something with yourself. That was their goal. Exactly. You know, and um, if I would have listened, you know, I, Things could have been so different, I, I think, you know. One of the things I always regret is not going to the military and seeing what happened. Yeah, same here, man. So, yeah. So that's why I started this this podcast, and to get to know people. It's like, man, right. you have a, have a lot in common. So let's say the 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 25-year-old version of Ty, what were you up to? I'm with trouble. <laughs> man, uh, you know, I... I, I I think sometimes now at 49, I'm paying like karma for all of the wrong I did back then. You know, all of the time I wasted and all that kind of stuff, you know. A lot of people don't even know my story because I really don't tell my story. This is really not one that I'm proud of, but, but I wasted a lot of time um, just doing the wrong things with the wrong crowd, selling drugs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I wasted so many years doing that, thinking I was actually doing something, you know. And I made money from it and everything, And it, but it's, it's, my old man always told me, fast money, go fast. Mm -hmm. And so all the years that I was doing that, I would make it fast, and then I would lose it fast, you know, for whatever reason. And um, in the end, you know, all of those around me, you know, 
that, that wrong crowd and all the stuff, all that stuff started dying around me. And that's when I realized it was time to, to get out and everything. And I went from that from one back thing to going into something else negative. You know what I mean? Because <clears throat> I never really wanted to have to work for somebody the rest of my life. You know, so I wasted I, I wasted a lot of years doing that. You know, and by the time I got out of the, of all of that, you know, it, and it it cost me a lot. You know, it cost me loved ones, relationships, family, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I was blessed to get out, and I'm blessed to still be here. Uh, <clears throat> but all the time that I wasted and all the years and all that stuff, it's like I'm trying to play catch up now It's 49, you know, because I feel like where I'm at now at 49, I should have been there at 25, you know. But with me not wanting to be legit and all that kind of stuff and fighting the system and the rebellion and all that kind of stuff. It just permitted me from doing the right thing, you know? So now at 49, I'm doing the right thing. I'm playing catch up on something that I'll never get caught up on. You know, it, it's it's the karma thing. Karma always catch up with you. But I am blessed that I am still here and I'm able to do what I like to do and enjoy. So it's a, it's a pro and con of everything. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Point of life, growing and, and learning. Um, exactly. Now, when you say that crowd around you started dying off, do you mean they were dying off, or were some some dudes actually physically dying? Both, both. People around me started dying. That whole thing, that whole business, or whatever, started dying off because the ones that weren't dying off were going to jail. Mm -hmm. The ones that weren't in jail yet were fleeing you know, trying to get away and all that kind of stuff. And I just hadn't got put in that kind of position yet. And I did not want to be in that in that kind of position. And with and with those certain people that was physically dying off, it gave me the opportunity to baby get out without being looked for or anything like that. It just gave me an easy way out. And so I took it, you know, and once I took it, I, I went, it was like starting over in life. I had to start over. I mean, and I'm, I'm talking about rock bottom, you know, but I had to do it. And uh, <clears throat> I'm glad I did it. It was hell, but it definitely taught me a lesson. It taught me to uh, be, be a, how to be a stronger person and stuff like that. So I wouldn't want to go through it again, though, you know. And so what was the next step for you? How old were you at this point? 30, maybe? By the time I'm I'm in my mid thirties or you know early thirties mid thirties something like that, and um, you know I, I at the same time when I was doing the wrong thing I was trying to find the right thing as well you know so I was <clears throat> working jobs here I, you know I did mechanic work I did mechanic work that was one of the main jobs that I did you know to keep the legit side to make it look legit while I was doing the wrong thing. You know, so I, I did a lot of years as a mechanic. Um, I worked for a, uh, a tire retread company, them companies that uh, retread the big 18-wheeler tires and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I've done warehouse work everywhere. I've done forklift operator jobs. I've worked forklift operators ever since I was 16, you know. So um, there was work involved, <clears throat> but that just wasn't my – it just wasn't important. That important to me like the other stuff was but now with this being important it was just trying to find out what i liked in life what i enjoyed and that's where the motorcycle thing came in. my dad was a rider he's he's always been a rider <clears throat> my brothers were riders you know forever you know i was a late bloomer but once i figured out once I got into that world, put it like that, I was like, okay, I can, I can be here for a while. And I've pretty much been there ever since. So, see, I didn't know that about you. I know we both have a motorcycle connection, but I didn't know you, you personally ride. So, so do you own a motorcycle now? I had two bikes and I sold two bikes. Okay. The reason I can't ride, and, I, and, and it's, it's kind of depressing, I because I, was it about two summers ago, three summers ago, I got into a... Uh, a car accident. I got hit by eighteen wheeler. <clears throat> and it on a bike? No, in my car. Oh, thank God. The crazy thing is, I was supposed to be 
on my bike. But I went outside and I had this bad feeling. And I went back inside, got my car keys, jumped in my car. Ten minutes later, I got hit. But um, it permanently damaged my um, spine. Mm. And um, but I kept riding and everything, you know. <clears throat> I wasn't gonna let nobody tell me I couldn't ride. The doctor said I couldn't ride long distance, but he said I he never said I couldn't ride, period. So I would ride, but the problem was ever since the accident, <clears throat> every time I would ride, I would end up not even being able to move the next day. No, or I'd yeah. be in deep compression for the next week or something like that, you know. And I did that for two years before I had to come to the realism that my riding days were coming to an end. Oh, man. That's rough. Yeah. Yeah. So so what'd you sell? Say again? What were, bikes, what were the bikes you sold? I had an anniversary edition uh, Dyna Lowrider, <clears throat> and I had a Heritage uh, Softail that I just sold less than a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I had a matter of fact, I think you were you you was there when I when I sold that bike. And I, I had put that bike, I brought I drove it up to the, the um to the front, you know, where the service area, the double doors open, he walked mm-hmm. through the yeah. service area. Instead of selling them my bike, <clears throat> I just put it in that right by the dyno machine and just advertised it right there. Oh wow. Independently. Yeah. And just sold it right, you know, right out of the shop. Man, there's a couple nice bikes, man. Yeah, it, it hurt. It it hurt. You know, the, the when I sold the the low rider, because I sold the low rider way before it was a heritage. When I sold the low rider, <clears throat> it put me in like a deep depression. But when I sold the heritage, it wasn't a depression, it was more like a weight lifted off my shoulders. Mm. Because I <clears throat> I'm struggling to ride that bike. And more and more it would have to just sit because I wouldn't be able to ride it. And it just got to the point where the bike wasn't being appreciated like a bike should be because yeah. I, I couldn't give it the love it, it deserved. And so once I sold it, and I made sure I sold it to somebody that was a, a real bike enthusiast, not somebody that was just jumping into it because it's bad for right now or something like that, somebody who was a collector. Yeah. Um, once I sold it to him and, and I saw him take off with that bike, it just I felt like I was giving it to somebody who could give it the love that I could. Yeah. So it was two different emotions on each bike, but yeah, my, my riding days are, are pretty much done. Man, that does suck. <laughs> that hurts just to hear it, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel you, but uh, I, I am curious. You say your dad is a rider, your, your brother's a rider. Are they, are they members of any kind of local clubs? Any, Motorcycle clubs? Um, no, nah, none of us have ever been um, affiliated with any kind of bike club. We've always been just independents. <clears throat> um, you know, my, my dad, he's always rode Harleys or nothing, and that's pretty much how I got into Harleys because that's all I ever rode. But my two brothers, you know, they're, they're big into the, um, what do you call it, the crotch rockets and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Stretch. Big fat tire kid in the back and all that kind of stuff, man. Yeah. You know, that's just not me. I'm more of a cruiser cruiser guy. So I, I never got into those those rice burning bikes. Now let me ask you this. Um <laughs> because I've only had a couple people who are uh, motorcycle riders enthusiasts on the show. Um now is there a uh, what do you think about the um black community of bike riders in Houston. Is there is there a thriving community of black uh motorcycle riders? <clears throat> oh yeah. They just not as known. You know, be, a lot of people don't know um how deep the black community is as far as, you know, with Harley in the Harley community and stuff like that. You know, it's there's always been that stereotype, whatever that Harley was meant for or is mainly for one group of people. Old, old then, white men, right? <laughs> right, and it's just not like that. I mean, if if you if you don't know about the bike world, that's what you think. Mm-hmm. But with us, that's been in it for who, you know, ever. We know how deep that rabbit hole goes. 
Yeah. You know, that genre is, has opened up for not only different races, but different occupations. You know, I mean, I mean, how, how big the female <clears throat> entity is involved in the Harley Davidson, people just do not know, you know, and the same thing with the black community. I mean, there are a lot of bike groups, predominantly black bike groups, uh, MC groups that are out there, you know, locally, out in each state and everything, man. I mean, from Kings on the Streets to the to the Ground Pounders to Hard Riders. Hard Riders, you know, the list the list goes on and on. Harley's Angels, which is an all female black group. I mean, it 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 just keeps going. So yeah. Gentlemen, right? So you've got Detroit yeah. gentlemen, Houston gentlemen, that that end. Exactly. You know. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there are a lot of groups uh out here, you know, that is a, a um that is a big genre, you know, as far as bikes and everything. Yeah. You know, lawyers, doctors. You know, it's not for that, you know, grungy, you know, <laughs> dude with the, the grease under his fingernails all day type thing no more. I mean, you know, you, you see a little bit of everything riding nowadays. Yeah, and buying buying bikes. Um, buying, yeah. yeah, so. All nowadays. So what would you say to somebody who, you know, um, you know, somebody out there who thinks it's not for them, they're not white, they're not whatever. Uh, thinking about hopping into it, what would your advice be? Do it. You know, I mean, the bike thing isn't limited to anything or anybody. That I mean, that's that's an open market that a lot of people haven't discovered yet. You know, I mean, it, it's don't think it's for one group of people or one group of person or anything like that. I mean, it's <clears throat> it's a world on, unto its own. You know, and it's a good one. You know, I mean, I love the bike world and I always will, you know, because just walking into a, a bike store and stuff like that, it's like walking out of one entity into another. You know, you walk into a totally different world when you walk into a bike shop. And that's what I appreciate about it and stuff like that. I mean, even working for a bike shop, that's not like working for an everyday company. You know what I mean? It's, to me, it's a beautiful thing and I love it. Yeah. So take me back a little bit now. So, so when you're you're getting your life back together, you're working warehouse jobs. Um, I assume at this point, mid thirties, you're still riding motorcycles. At this point, uh, what was the next phase for you? Is that when you decided to uh, get into guns, or had you always been into guns? <clears throat> well, or should I, I say firearms? I don't know what YouTube wants me to say. You probably know more about that than I do. Oh, but. man. With them changing up every day, who knows? It's hard to keep up with them. Yeah. But I was always into in the, in the firearms and stuff like that. Um, I never thought I'd, you know, do anything involving them as far as the YouTube channel or anything like that. I always just knew that I wanted to open a YouTube channel, uh, open a YouTube channel, I just never knew what I was going to do. And um, when the um, when the pandemic hit, it just gave me an opportunity to, I don't know, I don't know, broaden my horizons or, you know, just do something I hadn't done before. And at the same time, I had started buying, I had bought my, my first pistol, and my brother, my older brother, he already had a huge collection. And I started uh, messing with his collection and stuff like that. And um, the first pistol I had bought, I took it to the gun range and recorded it. And I posted it and got a lot of views. And I was like, okay, what if I do this on a YouTube channel? So I opened it up on a YouTube channel and I start gun collecting <clears throat> and I start putting my brother's stuff on the channel at first. And he started getting a lot of views and I started getting requests from other people. Hey, that was cool, man. I got a gun. You want to put it on the video? I'd be like, cool. And I put that gun on the video. Then another person and another person and another person. And um, it kind of blew up after that. Once I started doing the videos, 
I started getting um, <clears throat> advertisement companies or companies that sell guns and gun accessories and stuff. They started noticing the channel and they started reaching out to me to do advertisements and stuff. And that's how I was able to start doing the advertisements for the channel and, and for these companies as well. So it just started off just going to the range, doing something that was stress relieving to me. And it just kind of, it's been going ever since. Now, do you think that's, uh, you and I both have a similar story where we're, you know, both kind of like going through life, trying to figure out, figure out what our, what our path is. Do you think this is something that, that you finally found your thing? Uh, do I have a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. It's, it's something that I would like to continue to do. You know, even if I, I would even like it to be something that I could do every day you know what i mean because one day i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be able to stay at the shop forever even though i love the shop i'm not gonna be able to stay there forever but when that time comes and i have to leave the shop i just want to be able to um call my own shots you know if you will and i'm hoping that this can help me be able to do that you know what i mean because uh, you know I, I don't as far as i'm concerned this is the last company i ever want to work for here yeah it's just time to have your own thing exactly i'm I'm getting too old i'm too old so. yeah hey i'm i'm doing the martial arts thing and working the day job <laughs> same thing you know what i mean yeah ne i mean i'm I'm trying to network as much as i can um get as many business-minded people in my circle as i can you know stuff like that i'm trying to deal with as many companies as i can <clears throat> as far as advertisements and uh as long as it keeps me busy and it keeps growing i mean i'm i'm not gonna stop so so yeah. far so good so do you have any advice for uh people hopping in the youtube game it seems like uh your channel's going pretty strong and um what's your advice C. say again and see mm -hmm. the main word consistency you have to be consistent in this YouTube thing, I mean, it's, I, I can't stress that word. I can't, I don't even have enough time to be as consistent as I want in this thing. Just trust me. The way I want my channel to go, if I could have it my way, I'd be doing this thing every day, you know, but with the fact that me having to go to work and all that stuff, priorities, bills have to be paid and everything like that. I only have time to do this maybe uh, once every other weekend. <clears throat> And so it, it, it takes a lot. Creativity is a lot. It's it's um it's just a lot of work. If you it, it can be done, trust me, it can be done. It's a lot of guys out there doing it. It can be done, but it definitely takes consistency number one. And so, what are you what what's next for your channel? Do you want to do bigger things? Tell the people what some of the cool things you've done so far, and then maybe we'll talk about what you, what you'd like to do next. I think one of the coolest things that I did is I was able to go to the um, to do a tour of the um, Radical Firearms facility. And um, that actually was, so far, has been my most successful video. It still gets played today, every single day. I'm getting comments every single day, and that was over a year ago. But to be able to go to the facility, see how everything is made and the production of it and everything, and uh, it, it was it was it was an honor to be able to do that, and so that's one of the things that I'm working on is to be able to do you know go to these other manufacturers and uh, do the exact same thing, and um, hopefully it can take me out of state and stuff like that because I'd like to be able to travel to these other places and do the same thing. So now let's get back to you as a person. What or the lessons you've learned along the way. So you, you've uh, had a similar childhood as my own, kind of grew up, moved around a lot. Um, you know, as a young man in your 20s, you, you may have made some mistakes, but you were able to get back on course, um, find a passion for motorcycles, uh, new passion for firearms. What would be your 
advice for a young person out there and might be going through some of the similar things kind of lost as you put it? Uh, advice for somebody that's trying to stay out of trouble, you mean? Uh, right. well, trying to find their way, trying to find their way. Exactly. Both. What about, so what about somebody trying to <laughs> stay out of trouble too? I don't know. Find something that you're passionate about and stick with it. You know, that's, you know, it, <clears throat> sometimes it's hard to, um, that's easier said than done. Cause like I said myself, I really didn't, I didn't have a passion growing up. I didn't have nothing that I, I wanted to work towards or say, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And I know there are a lot of other people out there that's like that. So sometimes it's easier said than done, but don't give up. Find some, find something that you love to stick to. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. You know, and as far as what I've learned is, as far as doing this channel and stuff like that, I tell you one thing. <laughs> And I try to stress this a lot, <clears throat> especially when I'm talking to people. You think about it, the gun world is the only world that you don't have to get educated before you start doing that job, if that makes sense. What I mean is any other job that you go to, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, dentist, whatever, you don't just go in and start being a dentist or a lawyer or a doctor. You educate, you, you, you discipline yourself in that, in that field before you can become that. I've never understood, and as big as a, uh, you know, I'm a big two-way person and all that stuff, but I support common sense as well. And I've never understood why that same thing doesn't apply in the gun world. Because there's so much irresponsibility in the gun world, you know, and, and you know, people, they always say, you know, I'm going to take the class to carry class or whatever but number one just taking a carry class is not enough you're not going to learn everything you need to know taking that, that carry class the second problem is, is people say that but then they get the gun in their hand they feel the power and the education goes out the window and because of that you see all of the craziness that you see on the news every morning you know and stuff like that i mean every single day it's some gun thing. Somebody's been shot because it is somebody, you know, and, and the reasons that you hear of, you know, these, 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 these incidents happening, they just the craziest reasons I've ever heard. You know, I mean, the other day I woke up and two neighbors shot each other over a freaking lawnmower. I mean, it just gets no crazier than that. You know what I mean? It's <clears throat> people have to understand what, a gun is actually meant for. It's not meant for intimidation. It's not meant for anger. It's not meant, you know, for any of that kind of stuff. You know, a firearm is a last resort when there's nothing else to do type thing. You know, when people, oh, I felt my life was in danger. Uh, that's, you know, it's a fine line between a justified shooting and an unjustified <clears throat> And the only way to learn the difference is through the education. So I've always thought that the education of, of a firearm was extremely necessary before you were, before you were just able just to start carrying a firearm. You know, and that's that's just the one thing that I've always felt has been overlooked as far as in the gun world and as far as prevention. Put it like that. <clears throat> So what's next for you as an individual, Ty? Any plans, any big things coming up? <clears throat> I just live day to day. I, I you know, they, <laughs> there's no real big plans for me, you know, nothing. You know, there's goals that I would like to achieve. But as far as plans, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing and let it grow. You know, let it grow on its own because uh, right now I'm having fun with it. You know, I, I get an opportunity to, to see and experience things that a lot of people don't. I get to shoot a lot of things that a lot of people don't. I get to meet a lot of people that, you know, most people don't have the opportunity to meet just because of what I'm doing and stuff. So I, I enjoy it, man. I, I'm I'm on a I'm on a cool little ride right now, and I'm 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 not looking for anything else. I'm just doing it day by day right now. 
Now I gotta ask, what's the coolest thing you've got to shoot? Coolest thing I've got to shoot. I probably I I think I would have to say uh I just did a video, I think last weekend, you know, one of the guys uh called me from the uh gun club. <clears throat> Said he had the uh, John Wick AR there. If you check the uh, if you check my channel, you'll see it. It's a um, it's called a Tehran, a Tehran AR tactical. And yeah, and I remember when you showed it to me. He <laughs> came to me. And he, everybody he came up to me. And he showed me. He said, "Does this gun look familiar?" Yeah. And it took me about four seconds ago. This gun was in John Wick. Exactly. And you're like, exactly. "Oh, you're the only one that's that's that realized that." But it's not because I know a lot about guns. It's because I know a lot about John Wick. <laughs> but, uh, and once you walked up, I remembered the scene. It's the scene in part two where he goes to see the, the sommelier who, who, uh, is giving him all the, all the different weapons. Right. Right. And, right, uh, he's, right. he's like, Oh, well, what about dessert? So then he pulls out the knives. Right. But it, it's in that right. scene and, 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 and Cannell picks it up and he, he goes through the whole process of checking out the gun. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's in that scene. Uh, well, it's in that whole movie. Yeah, from that yeah. scene on, it's in there. And I can't remember if it's the same one that was also in the the hotel shootout scene in what was that John Wick three? Uh, there's it's, they've at, at the at the Continental they've had a few. Yeah, that, in John that Wick old, in John Wick four country. they were in Japan. Then they were they were in you know. So wait, was know. it was it was it three or four? Where the building was consecrated, and then they had that big shootout scene in there. Should be three, because in four they, you know, he got he got it, he got they were going to rebuild it. So I believe that's right. that was three, yeah. And right, two, yeah, I think three. he he just killed him. He killed um, uh, D'Antonio. Right, right, and right, then, right, right. You know right. that kicked off three, yeah. So yeah, I think it was three. I think that that's the same one I was using in the um, hotel uh, shootout scene, but that was the. Um, to me, I think that was one of the most awesome guns, you know, I've, I've shot, you know, and after that, I think I would say the um, Smith & Wesson 500 was just, it was super awesome to shoot. And also the um, the Tommy gun, Chicago typewriter is, is awesome. So, I mean, I, I mean, I've had some, I mean, I could just keep going, you know what I mean? Because every time I, I say one, then I start remembering another one that I shot, you know? So there was also a Scorpion with a binary trigger and it was, it was awesome. You know what I mean? So, the John Wick AR definitely is the best one I've shot, but there are so many that's close to it as well. As now, you've seen John Wick Four, right? Yes. The that gun—I don't know if it was a uh, shotgun, but it was shooting out the the incendiary dragon. rounds. Yeah, the dragon breath. Dragon breath. Yeah. That's a real gun, right? Yeah, but it's not the gun that's doing that. It's the ammo. Mm hmm. So you know you can. So the ammo is called Dragon Breath, not the. Not yeah, you can put that ammo in any shotgun, and it'll have the same effect. Have you shot that yet? No. Dragon Breath ammo. Mm -hmm. I have not shot the Dragon Breath ammo. Uh, I just ran into a guy. Matter of fact, a guy who's a customer at the shop who makes custom ammo and exotic ammo and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And one of the ammos that he makes is Dragon Breath. So I'm gonna get with him. <clears throat> And see how much he charges. I'm gonna definitely grab some of that and, and, and put it on the show. Most be a million views, baby. A million views. <laughs> Most definitely. It's been done before, so I wouldn't be the first. But yeah. I'm gonna definitely, you know, I'm gonna definitely do that. Well, I think um, you know, Chad Stahelski, the director of the John Wick movies, I think he got the idea from a YouTube video. He saw somebody shooting that in a YouTube video. So it's kind of like art imitating life at this point, you know. Right, right. We all know, you know, because if, if 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 you if you um watch YouTube and you're a gun enthusiast, then you know who Black Rambo is. Shout out Big Black. Everybody know Black Rambo. So if you know Black Rambo, you definitely know that he's done. I don't know Jack Black Rambo. He uh You don't know Black Rambo? No, he's a popular uh YouTuber. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You can't you can't say gun world without his name. You know, popping up. Black Rambo is is the gun YouTube. You know, I mean, aside from him, people like um, Hickok Forty Five, of course, and Kentucky Ballistics, and all that kind of stuff. John Rambo. I mean, uh, John Rambo. Black Rambo is 
uh, the gun YouTube. You know, he is the, he is the, person is the dude. Artist. Yeah, he is the man. You keep doing what you're doing, man. I think you're going to be the dude pretty pretty shortly. <laughs> man. Be, leave, be leaving the shop, putting in your two weeks' notice. You know? <laughs> Living up that crazy. sweet YouTube money, baby. It would be great, you know I me, mean? but you know the problem with YouTube, and, and I'm to the point now where I'm not really dependent on YouTube no more because their algorithm changes so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew guys that we're getting paid off of YouTube, you know, that was their, how they made their money. And now they're not just because of the algorithm change. Yeah. So they're very unpredictable. You know I mean? I've gotten to the point where <clears throat> being monetized by YouTube isn't that important, but the money that I make from the advertisements that I do, mm -hmm. that's become more of a priority. You yeah. know, because these companies pay me to advertise their product. So if I can get enough companies and enough product advertisement and stuff like that, you know, it's stuff like that, that, that I'm leaning towards more than the monetization of YouTube. Cause yeah. I, I honestly think that <clears throat> that road can lead me somewhere better than the monetization. Of YouTube. So for me, it's not about mon It's not, it's not about YouTube monetization anymore. It's about the advertising. Now, I had a question. I forgot it. <laughs> you said something about YouTube monetization. And I, and I totally, I had a question lined up and I totally forgot it, man. But uh, all right. So I guess we'll end it there, man. I want to thank you for your time. Give your channel one more giant shout out. Check it. Check it. Gats and Grips, G A T S N G R I P S on YouTube, man. My um, email is in the description. Any company or whatever that see this that wants advertisement. Let me know, because I definitely do more than just guns. Matter of fact, <clears throat> I'll be advertising this this weekend. So I got a video shoot to do about this, which is a cigar humidor. Uh, plus oh, bike. is this a humidor? So, yeah, so you're, I see you smoking a cigar. I didn't know. Uh, is that another passion of yours as well? Yes. Yes. I'm a big cigar person. Um, I do a lot of cigar stuff on my other social medias. Um, and I and, and those companies have started reaching out to me as well. So this is my first first company here that reached out to me to advertise their stuff. So look out for that video. I'll be doing that one in the next week as well. All right. Any, any sponsors out there want to sponsor uh, <laughs> Fury Cast? I'm always available. Oh, I do remember my question. So um, what? How would you handle a company if you didn't? Um, they wanted you to promote their product, but you didn't like their product. Like, specifically firearms or somebody you said hey take this firearm for the weekend you didn't really particularly like the firearm well didn't think it, it, it performed well how would you handle that honestly i've had product that i i've gotten and just did not like and for me even though <clears throat> they're paying for me to advertise it and it's like i tell them even when before i do the advertisement i'm going to give my honest review i'm not going to do it just to make this product look good because if the product is crap, I'm not going to tell you it's good. Then you get it and it's crap and you bought it off my name. You see what I mean? And, yeah. and you know, I'm not going to tarnish my name for another company. So I let them know what I do is through honesty. And if they don't like it, I apologize. If they do like it, great. But I've definitely given uh, bad reviews for product that I've gotten. I, I don't. I don't hold back just because it's just because they want me to promote it. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I want to say one thing to you, man, from somebody who has, uh, has a similar background, sim similar, um, you know, age, and we kind of grew up in a similar fashion, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, one of the, the, the key, uh, concepts of Jeet Kune Do, the style that he created is using no way as way. And I think you and I kind of grew up without a way, without a direction, but, mm -hmm later in life that became our way. So I look at you and I see uh, someone who actually has a lot of interests and a lot of passions and a lot of direction. And right. uh, so I think um, our past has only informed our, our, uh, our present, you know? So I want to thank you for being on the show and um, I'll see you soon, man. Hey, thanks for having me.
That's my conversation with Ty Blackwell. I want to thank him for coming on the show and sharing his story with us. If you're interested in following or subscribing to his YouTube channel, Gats and Grips, his links are in the description. You can also follow my new graphic novel, The Gentleman's Guild. Yes, I'm making a graphic novel. It's called The Gentleman's Guild with artist E. by Canalis. You can sign up for the mailing list now. The link for that is also in the description. And don't forget to watch Lion Killer my debut feature film that's right i made a movie it's called lion killer it stars regina ting chen who's currently on season four of stranger things you can watch it at amazon prime tubi tv freebie the roku channel or you can pop on over to the youtube channel called v movies thanks again for watching this episode of fury cast make sure you comment down below like this video subscribe and yes even smash that bell so you can be notified every time a Furycast video drops. Till next time, peace.